Okay, let's start to, with going through the, the highlights for the, for the quarter as well as uh, for the full year. The EBITDA uh, for the fourth quarter of 2019 turned, turned down to be 436 million uh, uh, NOC uh, compared to a loss of 118 million NOC in the same quarter the previous uh, year. Um, this shows that you know, the change of strategy from, from growth to profitability is starting to, to give effects and we expect that to continue into 2020. We, uh, we continue during the f fourth quarter to work on the, what I would call the balance sheet, and we also we raised capital, both as a, with a equity and, and a convertible bond during the quarter, as you, as you know. Um, we also uh, finalized the sale of the uh, domestic Argentinian business, and, uh, and uh, due to the fact that we didn't really get that to work uh, over uh, the year, and, and we decided then to exit that market uh, as such. Uh, if you look at the fourth quarter uh, as a standalone, we ended it with uh, a knock 6.5 billion in EBITDA. We started to guide on EBITDA uh, during, during 2019, and we ended up in the, in the higher portion uh, of the guiding, the previous guiding, where we guided 6.1 to 6.5 billion uh, for, the, for the full year. Uh, that is a doubling uh, uh, compared to the same uh, to, to 2018. Um, on Focus 19, uh, we ended that with also on target 2.3 billion in cost reductions. Very happy about that. And we are seeing that, uh, you know, the measures that we have taken through 2019 starting to give an effect on yields, profitability, and also we are able to keep the load factors uh, on an increasing uh, phase. Um, and also on functionality, which I will come back to, uh, is also developing very positively uh, over 2019, and, and uh, we will do our, our absolutely best in order to try to, to, uh, to, to make sure that that happens also into 2020. This is on, on full year. Um, and if you look at the, the ask in 2019, we had 1% growth coming from uh, out of 2018 with 37% growth. So quite a massive change between the two years. We have a 7% increase in unit revenue in 2019 compared to a reduction in 2018. And as I said, the load factors is, uh, is coming up. And uh, the graph here is showing the capacity in the gray area. And, uh, and uh, the bars is showing then the unit revenue compared to the, to the same month, 12 months uh, earlier or the, or the previous years. So what we are seeing now is that we have a, a growth uh, on, let's say, I think it is on 10 consecutive months compared to the same month the previous year. So all in all, we are seeing, really starting to see the effects and, and uh, looking into both February and, and March and April, uh, I think we can say that that trend is uh, continuing. Looking at Q4 and yield, um, I mean we have a 19% reduction in capacity in Q4 co compared to Q4 2018, um, compared to 32% growth the year before. Uh, so you're, you're seeing a, a, a quite, quite dramatic reduction in, in capacity, but at the same time, um, we have an increase in, in load factor. We're also seeing increase in yields, as you are seeing in the monthly traffic figures, and we saw a 10% increase in yield during the quarter compared to 2018. So all in all, good development. Also, on punctuality, 3%, 3.1% up in this quarter, and we are, you are seeing that uh, during the last six quarters, we have been doing better and better, also on punctuality. And on-time performance for us is a, is, a, is a high focus area that we have been working on for quite a while, and we are now starting to, to see improvements there as well. Uh, just as a information, I mean, the care and compensation is very much in, you know, affected by on-time performance. In Q419, we had 135 million knock in costs on care and compensation, compared to 360 million the same quarter the previous years. So a reduction of close to or, or at approximately 62% as such um, year on year. We have done a massive uh, review of the short-term network through 2019, 
Uh, in total, we have taken out 70 routes during the year, 50 routes on short haul, 20 routes on, on long haul. And this is what, what we are now planning to produce during the coming summer. So what you are seeing is that we have taken out capacity from Sweden and Finland. Um, and we are now starting as a result of that to see an increasing yield in both those markets. Uh, Denmark and Norway is stable, profitable, um, uh, and continue, will continue to be profitable. Dublin and Edinburgh, we have closed down on short haul. Uh, that involves also the long haul, <laughs> the long haul you know, uh, uh, flights to the US with, with, uh, with the maxes by obvious reasons. We have taken down some capacity in Gatwick, and we have closed down uh, two, three bases, uh, or two bases in Spain and also in, uh, in Rome on short haul. Uh, so, so five bases have been closed uh, through, uh, through 2019. We have restructured the Canary Islands, and, and uh, we feel now that we have uh, the, you know, the, the bases that we need with the, with the number of aircrafts. You will probably see some changes during 2020 as well, but not in the same pace as you have seen in 2019. On long haul, a little bit of the same picture, really. Also done quite a, an extensive review of that program during the last 12 months. <clears throat> and so what we are seeing now is that they're consolidating the long haul business, at least on the European side, into uh, fewer hubs. So we are now focusing on the UK, Gatwick, we have uh, uh, Paris and Italy and, and Spain. And then we are in the process now of consolidating the Nordics long haul hubs into Oslo. Uh, there was a fight between Denmark, I would say, and Oslo. We ended up in Oslo uh, because the three as, an, as a standalone didn't really work profitability-wise. So we, are now, we now think that we are, when we are taking it into Oslo, um, closing down uh, Copenhagen and Arlanda, uh, we should be in, in a much better place to, to generate cash flow going forward. Looking at uh, <coughs> uh, the, the different markets, I mean, Norway is still uh, dominating, but it's very nice to see that uh, U the U.S. is uh, having the, the, the biggest growth. Also very nice to see that Italy and uh, Spain is performing well, growing at growing yields. Finland and Sweden, as I said, is, uh, is coming down uh, when it comes to the growth. But, uh, but uh, on the other side of that, uh, the yields in both those markets uh, are coming up. So I think the measures that we have taken there is starting to work. Into the financials. Um, if you look at the P&L for the, for, the, for the quarter, we have a 70% reduction in revenues, as you can see, and, uh, but that is on a 19% reduction in capacity. On the cost side, the absolute cost is down by 1.3 billion, representing 13%. Ideally, I would like the cost to go down by the same as the capacity, i.e. 19%, but that is a challenge when you are taking out the capacity that we have been taking out in a relatively short period. I'll come back to that. But it takes us to an EBITDA of 436 million NOC, uh, that is up 550 from the same quarter last year. Um, and we are ending then the quarter with 2 billion loss and 1.9 on the, on the bottom line. IFRS is approximately 114 million negative uh, in this, um, but also, and that is compared to a 3.9 billion loss in 2018. Um, uh, but have in mind that we had a quite huge hedge loss in 2018 that is uh, affecting that, uh, that result. We are not happy with $2 billion in loss for, uh, for the fourth quarter, uh, but at the same time, I think we, when we are seeing now the profitability increase coming back to us, I think we are pretty well you know, situated in order to come into 2020, and I'll come back to, to how we look at 2020 also guiding-wise uh, a little bit later. If you look at uh, the, the revenues, I mean, we are 16% up on Rusk compared to the same quarter last year. 11% in constant currency, uh, and ancillary revenue is, is uh, you know, slowly developing in the right direction, has been doing that for quite a while, and, and, um, and all in all, quite okay with the, with the, with the rust development uh, as per now. Looking at the cost side, um, that is, uh, you, know, you know, an area that we are, you know, I would say, struggling a little bit in order to 
to cope up with the, with the capacity reduction that we have uh, taken. But if you look at constant currency, you can say that we are 11% uh, down on revenues uh, and we are only 4% up on cost const with, with, with a currency constant, comp you, know, you know, comparing the two, the two periods. Um, I think what we are seeing is that, is that you know, when we are taking out that this, this capacity, 90% in the quarter, it is, it is a challenge to be able to take out the same amount of cost in the same period. Um, we, are, we have made a small little graph on the, on the top right-hand side there that shows a, a monthly um, um, cost development in the blue bar. So, so you are seeing that it, it's peaking in November. It's starting to come down in December. We expect that to continue into the first quarter. And when I'm coming back to the guiding, you will see that we expect the, the, the cost now to, to come down through 2020. And this is a very high focus area internally, and we, we have to make sure that, that we are able to take out the cost in line with the capacity reduction. Uh, but normally you will have a lag, time lag um, in, that, um, in, in that area. Uh, all in all here, yeah, this is, this is a, you know, obviously a development. Even if the absolute cost is going down in the company, the unit cost is going up. Uh, again, very nice to see that the handling costs are coming down, uh, mostly due to, I mean, we have done some quite good deals with, uh, with uh, our vendors. And uh, uh, I mean that we have re renegotiated uh, the, you know, many of the contracts. And, and the on-time performance is also, also coming up, helping to take the, cost and the care and compensation costs down to a level where it should be. I think we have still more room uh, on, on that side, by the way. Focus 19, this is uh, the last time you will see anything about Focus 19. Uh, we, we, guided, uh, we guided the market uh, a quarter ago, uh, saying that we, we increased it from 2 billion to 2.3. We almost got there. I think we are missing a few millions. So we ended up with 2292. And we are quite happy with, uh, with, uh, with that project, I would say, um, over delivering what we promised a year ago. This is not the end of the cost reductions in Norwegian, just to make that 100% clear. This is a process that will continue. And we will come back to, to, to that a little bit later. Uh, full year. Um, Ended up at 43.5 billion on, on the top line, 8% revenue growth on a 1% ask growth for the full year. Uh, I'm ending up then for six, uh, close to 6.5 EBITDA. And, uh, and I would say with that, we are quite happy. It's a, it's a doubling uh, compared to, to 2018. And we ended up then the year with 1.688 loss uh, for the full year on, uh, on EBT compared to 2.4 in 2018, but have in mind that we have a 1.9 gain from the so-called impairment transaction on the bank shares to, uh, you know, affecting the 2018 uh, year. Obviously a year we are not happy with, but we are on the right, definitely on the right direction in the company. I think it's very important as well that you all know that into the 2019 figures, we have booked a loss of a close to 1 billion NOC due to the max situation. We have also booked uh, a loss on the 787 engine issues during the year at approximately 750 million. So 1.7 billion is taken into the P&L as a net loss from the issues that we are having on, these, on, on, the, on, on the aircraft that we are flying. EFRS uh, effect is also a negative of 750 million uh, for, the full, for the full year. So have that in mind when you are looking at the loss of 1.6 billion for the year, as you can see here. Balance sheet, not many comments. I mean, one comment is that you, know, you can see that asset side is going down from 71.9 to 66.3 billion, so a reduction from last quarter. Uh, we have uh, also a few aircraft now uh, classified as assets held for sale. That is the 737-800s that is sold, five of them, that will be delivered through the current quarter, meaning the first quarter. We also have a change in currency, um, you know, affecting the, the asset side with uh, 2.4 billion. And uh, we have also sold, I mean, we have sold nine, 10 aircraft now uh, where all these will be delivered through uh, first quarter. 
uh, and uh, that is also then included here in, uh, in, the, in the balance sheet. Uh, cash is 3 billion, receivables is 10 billion. Uh, I think we will have to see, say that you know, we have on this cre credit card requires, we have onboarded credit card requires, we have some delays in uh, kind of them getting uh, you know, online and, and to start to process, but we are these days onboarding one of our biggest uh, credit card requires, which will give liquidity effect uh, immediately and, and towards the, the end of Q1 and into the second quarter. On current debt, 8.7 million, 1.8 of that is related to the aircraft uh, that is already sold but not delivered, but here it's classified as a short-term uh, debt. That is a 10 aircraft and which will give us close to 1 billion of free liquidity at delivery of these aircraft during the current quarter. Uh, cash flow, I'm not going to go through the, you know, all the details on the cash flow. I just want to mention that uh, on net cash flow investing activities, 8.3 billion, that includes 12 sales of, of aircraft. And the same applies to uh, the principal repayments, uh, where we are paying down the debt uh, on the same aircraft as such. Have in mind also that IFRS 16 is also coming in here, uh, for example, on financing costs paid. 1.7 billion of that is related to in the interest portion of the, of, the, of the lease payments that we are paying to the leasing uh, companies. Just to summarize a little bit of what we did um, in 2019, I mean, Focus 19 we have been through. Uh, we have been de deferring deliveries both on the Airbus side and on the Boeing side, where we have taken out 22 billion NOC of CapEx split on 2019 and 2020. We sold the Bank Norwegian shares, uh, freeing up a lot of liquidity last year. We refinanced the two bonds uh, for uh, approximately two years. Uh, we have sold 24 aircraft, 22 Boeings, two Airbuses, net liquidity of 2.2 billion. Finally, we were able to uh, you know, deliver that joint venture uh, that, takes that takes care of all deliveries from Airbus until the end of 2023, reduces the capex with 13.7 billion NOC, and we do expect to see a liquidity effect of that joint venture during 2020 as, as, as well. We did the private placement and the convertible bond, as you all know, and we sold off the Argentinian business, um, and we are now in the process of getting those aircraft back from Argentina. The last one is coming back in May, June this year. Outlook, I have to admit that this is a, a difficult slide to go through because it involves so much uncertainty, especially on the Mac side. But as you can see, in 2019, uh, we ended with 156 aircraft in operation. That is 37 Dreamliners. It's 18 Maxes. They're all rounded. And then you have the, the, the NGs split on 61 leased and 40 owned. So looking into 2020, we do expect to take delivery of four Dreamliners. We have included 16 maxes here for delivery in, in uh, 2020. I, I'm afraid that I think that's completely unrealistic, but that is what Boeing is contracted to deliver to a Norwegian. We are, est we are now not planning the summer program with, with maxes flying. We, are, we estimate the maxes back in the air at the earliest in September. Um, and, and so, so, so we would just have to see later this year, you know, what happens with this, uh, with this max uh, situation. So during the year, we have, we have sold already 10 NGs. That takes us from 40 to 30, 30 as you can see. And we are re-delivering eight of the leased uh, aircraft. That's, le that's aircraft that we leased back in the years. And we're also delivering 12 of them uh, in 2021. So... Uh, there is, that's why we are guiding on 13 to 14 or 13 to 15 percent reduction in ASP this year, and, uh, and but it's highly uncertain depending on when these maxes are back in the air. So on the max situation, I mean we have 18 grounded, we have 13, 14 produced and uh, parked in um, in uh, in Seattle. So we are more than 30 aircraft short compared to what we were planning for a year ago. 
Um, we have estimated a, a loss on this situation, and that is a net loss uh, of a billion. Uh, we have, um, you know, we, we had hoped that we could enter into an agreement with Boeing at this time, but, the, you know, the timeline is, is changing all the time. Now we have to start discussing the whole summer program, and we will have to bring the discussions with Boeing now also in involving the next six months, really. We were all hoping that these aircraft would be back in the air prior to the summer. That will not happen as we see it today. And now the, the, the kind of discussions, negotiations should also have to involve at least six months going forward from now. That's why this is dragging out a little bit. But we are still in, in a good dialogue with, uh, with them. On the Dream Miner side, um, these engine issues hasn't really stopped. We still have the same issues. We will have them through 2020. We have, as you know, taken delivery of 37 Dream Miners as per today. We are flying today between 25 and 26, meaning that there is 12 air aircraft on the ground, parts, maintenance, change of engines, etc. And, and this is, you know, uh, the plan forward is to now start the summer program with 32 aircraft in the air. And then we have, a, we have had and have a really good uh, relationship to, to Rolls-Royce, and we, we, we have found a solution with them with regards to compensation. It's not a fantastic solution, but it's, it's a solution that we can live with and, uh, and, and not at least plan for going, uh, going forward. Guiding. Um, due to what I just said, I mean, we are guiding now a reduction uh, on 13 to 15% on capacity. The last guidance we gave was 10%. Uh, we are guiding unit cost uh, inclusive uh, uh, depreciation uh, actually fuel of 0 0.33 to 0 0.34 and then the with fuel is 44 and 45 we are guiding now a net profit for Norwegian for the full year but that is on the assumption that we will have the maxes back in September the fuel prices as we are listing here we have used the situation now when, where the jet fuel has come from 660, 650 down to now, I would say, low 500s. So we have used that, uh, you, know, you know, reduction in order to start hedging. So we have hedged 35% now in the first half at 578, and for the full year, 25% at 571. That means that we are, compared to our competitors, now seeing hedging in the area 80 to 100 dollars a ton lower than our competitors. I think you will see us during the next weeks also increasing that hedge at what I would say very comfortable levels in general and also compared to, to our competitors. It also assumes that we will find a good uh, agreement and, 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 and a beneficial agreement for Norwegian with uh, both uh, Rolls-Royce and Boeing on the, on the asset side and then the the issues that we have with, with the aircraft. I think that, that was it, Jakob. Thank you, Geir, and good morning, everyone. Um, I am uh, now approximately six weeks into the job, um, and um, those six weeks I've been uh, traveling a lot around to see the business. Um, as I see it uh, so far, if I should kind of come up with a, a plan in six weeks, I would say there are three things that will have my attention uh, going forward now. It is to uh, steer the employee engagement in the same direction in the company, uh, and it also to unlock the full potential in the organization through clear and visible uh, leadership. So that's the first thing. The second thing, is to strengthen and stabilize the profitability through program next. Uh, the third thing that will have a lot of my attention 
is really to build and position Norwegian into the future of mobility through eight building blocks that I will come back to. The aviation industry is new to me. Um, however, especially now after being six weeks into the job and traveled that much around, I have to say that it has a lot of similarities to retail. Pricing optimization, a huge topic within retail and sophisticated topic. Constant product and concept development. Optimizing the customer experience, building a sales culture. Safety and security culture, huge topic where I came from. Building operational excellence and a lean operation culture. And last but not least, focusing on getting great employee engagement. We have over 11,000 employees. And especially the last two, operational excellence and employee engagements, is extremely hard to copy for a competitor. That's really where we build a competitive edge, in my experience. Therefore, one of my top priorities was to see operation and meet our people. That's why I use so much time on that now. I have been, I have approximately handshaked 1,000 people in these uh, six weeks. I have visited our bases in Dublin, Barcelona, London, Fornebu, of course, and also spent a full day at uh, Oslo uh, Airport. Um, I have used a lot of time on one-to-one -one meetings with over 50 managers from half an hour to two hours. Um, from more than 30 departments. And what I see is really engaged employees, and I see people that are extremely proud of working for Norwegian. And I think that's uh, one of the best bases you can have to, to further build this company. And I also see huge competence within the company. I also see a lot of unlocked potential from structure, systems, leadership, accountability, collaboration, etc. So what I've done here will not be the, a one-time stunt. Um, I will continue this from the middle of the march, and my aim is to visit all the bases, all the Norwegian people, before summer. This is who I am as a leader, and I want to underline that. I'm used to it. During a year when I was in Circle K, uh, it was quite common for me to visit at least 200 stations during a year. That's how I perform my leadership. And I can also assure you that the executive team and myself will be around in all corners of the business going forward. So that's kind of the first uh, element that will take a lot of my attention. Another top priority is the next program. That is a continuation from Focus 19 that we just heard Gary talking about that delivered 2.3 billion NOC. And I think 2020 is all about operational improvement on revenue and costs. And also to ensure the right speed into 2021. So the program next will not only be for 2020, it will also continue into 2021. So this is really our short term two year plan. 
Next, as it is, as I'm speaking, consists of 277 initiatives. 40 of them are completed. It's six work streams, network, which means where and how to fly, people, which means the best use of crew, product pricing and revenue management, which really means customer optimizations in, in all the elements, operational uh, performance, which means smart operation, efficient operation, and lean operation. Cost reduction, procurement, which means striking the balance of being really fit and being too skinny. And last but not least, value proposition, where to compete in the future. The program consists of a program, uh, program management office. It's organized under guide, under finance. It has dedicated people, 100% people working just to organize this. It has a tracker system listing all the activities, listing the deadlines, the responsibilities, listing the effect and what will be also the effect on the P&L. And I've seen many of these programs through my 30 years of business. I also constructed several of them. But I have to say this program is one of the best I've seen. It's really best practice on how to run a program like this. We follow it up closely. We have a weekly cycle, which means that on Thursday, the PMO, the people that leads this program, sits together with Geir, that is the project leader of this, goes through it, see the bottlenecks, decide on how to move forward. Uh, then on Friday, we have a status together with me, Geir, and the team. And on Monday, we discuss it in the executive team. We also have there what we call the strategic agenda, where we have all the big elements of next, prepared, discussed, and decided, and also allocated resources, resources whether it's people or money. And then on a monthly basis, we have a steer co, including several people from the board. So I think it has a lot of attention. That will be the cyclus moving on. Um, and it's really hands-on. So I would characterize Next as the power engine within the company, where all qualified activities will be feeded into the program. So that number will change as we go forward and also, the, of course, the numbers on the, on the bottom. But all the qualified activi uh, activities are rolled in, and they will get two things. And I want to underline this, because working in big companies, uh, you see often very a lot of activities that don't kind of end in nothing. But the two most important things to make things happen in a big company is that it has top management attention, and it's allocated resources. And that's what this program do. If you have an activity that qualified to go into here, it gets top management attention and it gets resources. The financial impact of next in 2020 is estimated to 1.5 billion mark on the P&L. Revenue cost, we also measure the cash flow, the liquidity in this program. Just to give a couple of short comments on the content, 180 of these initiatives that you saw on the previous page is tied to the bucket called cost out slash procurement. A lot of medium small in, uh, initiatives, but super important. Several activities are focused on getting us from a manual position into more an automated position. Like for instance, on people, on crew optimization, a system called Jeppesen that help us optimize uh, the crew in a better way. Uh, also within um, pricing optimization uh, with, uh, with um, a, a system called Fairlogic 
and a third element on operational performance, uh, which is called tail optimization. Things that uh, we absolutely need. Also a number of big initiatives, like for instance on crew optimizations that we can work across the AOCs and not being limited to, to certain AOCs. Uh, fair ladders, which means how you kind of build the pricing compared from when you put out the tickets until you depart with the airplane. How do we build that pricing curve? Those fair ladders is out for approximately 30% of our routes and will be in a short time on 70% of our routes. So there's a lot of uh, individual activities in, in this program and that will have huge attention going forward. The third topic that will really take um, a lot of my attention and, and my team's attention will, build, will be to, to build Norwegian into the future of mobility. And what do I mean about that? I see three phases of us moving forward. The first phase is really the shortest one. That's from now until summer or maybe fall. And that's really taking the company from the phase that we have now, which has been growth, and into the profitability. A lot of the concrete activities started last fall that uh, Geir has talked about, but it's also taking the whole organization into that mode. It is different being a company that has been growing extremely, almost like a super big entrepreneur company, and then going to have more stabilized profit, to be um, uh, solid, to be even more professional, and to be a more major company. And that's what we want to build in phase two. And I've done this before, and it takes at least three years to build, and five years to achieve the culture you want for that phase of a company. And the reason why we want to do that is that we need to position ourselves to be present when the big discussions come about future mobility. We are not there today. We need to strengthen the company to be present when that battle starts. And I believe that battle starts after 2025. We need to understand what is future mobility within aviation. I'm not saying it's going to happen in 2025, but that's at least when you need to be positioned to talking about it, to have opinions about it, and to prepare for that. I'm absolutely sure that we will not have electric planes now within the next five to ten years, uh, but maybe 15. And I can assure you, in the previous industry that I was in, it happened much earlier than everyone thought. Seven years ago, nobody thought electric cars would have the presence as they had today. Nobody. All of us were thinking about 2040, 2050. Now the business plans is 2025. So this happens, tends to happen much earlier. And I want this company to, to be positioned for that uh, discussion. And I believe to take us there, we need to focus on eight building blocks that will gradually get a lot of content. We have to have a strategy on how to compete, where to compete, which I will call the value proposition. And then when you know that, then you have to have a strategic platform, which I will come back to. Secondly, you need to have a structure of the organization that fits the phase you're going into. We don't have that structure today. That will be developed. And I'm especially talking about level one to three leaders. My experience is that if you have the one to three leaders, um, with the right structure and the right people, you can move the company kind of in whatever direction you want. 
So right leaders is the third element, and when I say that, it's really competence and behavior. And again, I want to underline, it's tremendous amount of competence already within Norwegian. Leadership principles, really about how do we develop the leadership principles for the leaders we have, being a role model for values, setting strategic direction at all levels, follow up on performance standards, develop people in the company, super important examples of leadership principles. To have a governance model means how do you really work together one thing is having an organizational chart, but how does this organization work together? It's big, and we need to define that on a strategic level, on an execution level, and on the people level. And then having a distinct operating model, which really means how do you steer the company in terms of all the plannings, especially within this business, how to allocate planes, how to plan routes and network, how to optimize crew, etc., etc., from kind of five years ahead to three years to one year to actually the actual flight is going. That circle needs to be very clearly defined. Mandate structure, uh, it's go without saying. Uh, costs is a big element in the company. Uh, that, of course, needs to be very clear. Who has what mandates, etc. cetera. Um, and it is clear today. I have to underline that. But it's always changing when, when you move to a new phase. And then, of course, one performance management system, meaning how do you develop people in the company? How do you split the goals from the region down to each and every people? And we can be better on a lot of these building blocks. And we have to be better if we are going to move this company from the first phase to the second phase to the third phase. And that's not unnatural. It's quite natural. One word about the uh, value proposition. That work started before Christmas, before I entered the company. Uh, it was stopped waiting for me to enter. I uh, kicked it off again last week and it will be finalized and delivered early April. And the value proposition again is where do we compete compared to the others? And when you define that, it's really about defining then the, what I call the strategic platform, which means what is our dream? What is our business idea? What is our DNA in the company? And what should we be famous for? in the customer experience. This is important because it guides you on designing the right organization. It guides you on how you develop the brand platform. It guides you on what kind of specific business strategies you have in the company. I believe sustainability will be an important element of this. I can't say today exactly how, but I believe sustainability will be important in this work. And I believe sustainability is good business. It has to be both. I believe in sustainability from a climate perspective, but I also believe in it from a business perspective. One day, we will also see the airline business with zero emission. But in, in the meantime, because that will take some years, we have to take responsibility as other industries. And I think we have a very good starting point in Norwegian. I think the low cost model we have is a brilliant starting point. Because we have a modern fleet, if you compare from 2009 to 2019, we have 33% less CO2 emissions than with the old fleet. And if you add the new planes when they start to fly, it's another 20%. The low-cost model has direct flights. The low-cost model has 
low price on tickets, which also means very often higher load factor. So all of this together and a lot of other things, I think we have a very good starting point compared to a lot of others. So my last point will be fundamentally, I believe in bringing people together. Uh, then magic, magic happens, then we develop. Uh, and that's the business we are in. We are in the business of bringing people together. And I don't believe in a world where we stop transporting people. We bring people together and we will continue doing that, but we will also continue doing that in a smarter way. And that's what also consumers should think about, fly smarter. Thank you. We will now open up for questions from the audience. Uh, due to our online audience, please wait until you get the microphone. Uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, one, if the max is grounded during 2020, how will the cost develop compared to 19? That's one. And second, uh, pre-booking on into 19, uh, into 20, how is that uh, year on year on volume and also on price? Uh, well. Um I think on the cost, when we, when we are guiding, when we have guiding as you, as you, as you have seen, that, uh, that, includes, that includes the fact that you know, we are not expecting the maxes to be back in the air until September. Uh, but at the same time, we are planning to fly the whole summer program. That means that we would have to take in, uh, take in wet leases or dry leases during the summer, as it looks now. So, so you could say that if the maxes are not coming, coming in prior to the summer, we don't really need that many of them into the winter either. So, so, so the problem is getting less as you go into, you know, closer to the winter as such. Um, when it comes to the, to the guiding and, uh, you know, I think I would just have to refer to the traffic figures. As, 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 as we have seen, you know, the last 10 months we have beaten the previous year on, uh, on, on Rusk. The load factors are, are coming up and the yields is, uh, is coming up, 10% in 19. And if I look very short term into, let's say, February, March, April, it seems like that tendency, uh, you know, that tendency is, is continuing. Uh, as I said, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, maybe March is a little bit uh, slower than, than, than February, but still a little bit early. But, but all in all, we are seeing that, you know, the trend we have seen during the last six months is continuing. And one last, if I may, uh, and the CEO, yeah, welcome to Norwegian. Uh, on all the initiatives you see you have launched now and you've gone through, uh, what do you think actually will, uh, you mentioned, uh, I guess most of them are important, but on ancillary side, uh, do you have a target there? I think the old target was around 15%, but then you, you see a potential here that is not taken out. Yeah, on ancillary, I don't want to guide on a specific percentage, but I definitely see more potential. Um, this is actually an area that I will compare very much to retail. Um, uh, really creating uh, or improving the sales culture. Um, and um, I think there is a lot of opportunities, uh, both when you are flying, uh, to, um, to um, kind of bring retail into the air, to say it that way, uh, but also uh, in terms of um, before you are flying, in terms of how you put together your ticket, etc. I think one example of that is how we handle the baggage, um, the new hand luggage, etc. So I definitely see more potential there. I don't want to commit to any number yet at all, but uh, yes, there is more potential, and yes, um, I think we can also improve uh, on the sales culture. Uh, we have a very good fundament, but uh, I think we can improve. 
I think just to add on, on what Jakob is saying, I think also when you know we are we are often being criticised because uh, you know our, our percentage-wise the salary is lower than the peers. I think uh, it's a little bit of you know a number play in my opinion. You, I think you, what you have to look at. I mean, there's no no doubt that we have more room to increase the ancillaries, but I think you should also look at you know the the, the, the revenue per passenger as a total when you compare you know between airlines. Hi, good morning. I'm Daniel from Bernstein. Thanks. Uh, three, if I may. <coughs> Number one, Jacob, welcome. Um, how did you prepare, kind of before you started, kind of last year, for your new role at Norwegian? Um, uh, secondly, kind of also in your early observations, maybe even before you joined the business, right, with what hypotheses did you go into the business? Um, if I may be so frank, what do you think was going wrong? Um, because we heard a lot about what is going right, right? But what are the things where you thought, well, that's really something I need to challenge the team on. And then more broadly, while I understand the longer term strategy here, um, positioning the company for future mobility, kind of there are two elephants in the room. And number one is how do you actually do turn this long haul concept profitable to acceptable levels? And secondly, you're still planning to take 30 or more planes from 2022 onwards, it's time to talk to Boeing about that too. So what are you doing about the fleet delivery plan beyond 21? I try to remember your questions. Uh, if not, uh, help me again. Um, how did I plan uh, before I came? Uh, I, of course, tried to read a lot about the industry. Um, I previously worked in um, in McKinsey, so I have a pretty good network there. So I talked a lot with um, previous colleagues, experts within aviation. Um, I uh, had several one-to-one -one meetings with external people, both people that has not been in the avi aviation industry, but more from leading big companies, and especially kind of the first uh, months what were your priorities going into kind of a company where there is a lot of things. You have to kind of see through it and, and prioritize. So I got some, ex uh, some experience there. Uh, and uh, I really prioritized meeting the team, the team that I knew I was going to, uh, to work with, the people that were going to report to me. So um, before I officially started, I had two to three hours with each of them. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, we are also using some external people internally to also help us uh, moving forward. So I used uh, several workshops together with them. Um, what did I tell them to come in, uh, etc.? I think uh, my agenda was not about telling them what to do. My agenda was having big ears. Uh, I really want to listen to people, talk to as many people as possible, to see issues from different angles, uh, and learn the business. Um, so I would rather kind of rephrase your question on what brought me into this company. Um, and I think what really brought me into this company was I think it is a fantastic story. I mean, seeing it from the outside, being a consumer, seeing kind of, it, for me it's a Norwegian fairy tale. Uh, seeing this company growing from uh, actually being almost a bankrupt previous company, BCB, and then growing uh, the way it has done, uh, I just said to myself, that must be an interesting company. Secondly, um, I think the brand is fantastic. The brand, uh, branding resonates with me, but I have to resonate with a company with a great brand. I think Norwegian is a great brand, and I'm saying, I also said that before I joined the company, because I think it is a brand where you are allowed to surprise, where you are allowed to play, rather than a lot of the other uh, airlines, where, which are more boxed in. If somebody should expect new things, it should really come from Norwegian. That's kind of my perception when I got into the company. 
thirdly, I think uh, it had a fantastic uh, asset base. Uh, it was not kind of a super small company with big ambitions. It already had a lot of plans. Uh, it had a lot of roots. It's done some uh, interesting uh, new things. I think that was interesting. Fourth, I think uh, I'm attracted to businesses where people make a difference. Uh, and this is that kind of a business. I mean, you have to have great pilots, you have to have great crew, you definitely have to have great ground operations and now being around, if we fully understand how much it takes to get the plane in the air and how that hangs together, great people make a difference. And also the people working to, to plan the company in, in what I call a service office. We are not a head office, we are a service office. So, um, because then leadership matters and I care about leadership. And last, um, uh, which also dragged me into this, is uh, future mobility. Um, I think the biggest trend that, trend that is facing us as uh, humans is really mobility. I think mobility will change what is happening in mobility. The next 10, 15 years will change society. It will change business and it will change our personal life. And I saw that within uh, uh, the car industry. I'm also sitting in the board of uh, Merle Group, which uh, imports Volkswagen Audi and Skoda and Seat, and been there for almost 15 years. So I have seen the inside of the car producers, and uh, the revolution that's happened there is uh, fantastic. And I say to myself, this also has to happen within the airlines, <coughs> and I want to take part of that. And I think the moment is now. So that really dragged me into it. And then you had a couple of other questions as well. What turns long haul profitable? Um, and two, what about the seat orders past 21? Yeah, that was the two difficult questions. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't have the answer on what turns long haul profitable. Uh, I just see that uh, what Norwegian has done is um, interesting. Um, trying to get low cost succeeding on long haul. Nobody kind of proven that business model yet. But um, I see a lot of opportunities um, that we can um, uh, uh, do on short term, but then we also need, of course, to, to think long term. What kind of strategy will bring this to, to profitability, as you say, um, and, uh, and fuel the company? Uh, that is too early to say anything about, but, uh, but um, uh, yeah, I, I want to come back to that when we have more clear answers on it. But I definitely don't want to just throw it out. I really think we have a potential that we should try to go after. And then I have to come back later to say if, if it's viable or not. And the last question was about the airplanes. Yeah, then I have to lean on you yeah. guys. Just, just a comment on the long haul as well. Uh, uh, I mean, I, you know, as you saw here, you know, we have we have been doing quite some steps during uh, 2019 where we are consolidating into the four bases, consolidating the Nordics into Oslo. Uh, but have also in mind that we have we have lost 750 million knock due to the engine issues. Mm. I mean, have, have uh, think about it, guys. We have, we have taken 37 deliveries. We are flying 25, 26 aircraft. The, the rest is parked due to engine issues. Uh, where we are sitting there paying uh, capital costs and these problems, these problems will continue into 2020 at least. So, so, so have, that, have that in mind um, and, and you know, I, I, can, I can go on with, uh, with loss of revenues, with uh, you know, more fuel burn on the wet lease and, and etc. So it, it, have that in mind when you're doing the, when you're doing the numbers. Um, when, it comes to, when it comes to the order book, I mean as we all know, we are in dialogue with, uh, with Boeing, and, and 
that dialogue also involves, involves uh, a new delivery schedule because it's quite obvious that these uh, guys are not able to deliver the aircraft when they were supposed to do so. And we are very soon coming into the 12 months mark, meaning that you have a right to cancel. And I think Boeing is sitting there today expecting that at least some of the customers will cancel. So it's a, a huge puzzle for Boeing as well. That's one point. And the other point is that you know, have in mind that the plan in Norwegian has been to replace the 737 NGs, 800 NGs with MAXs. So right now we have approximately 100 NGs and we have 92 MAXs at order uh, not delivered. So, so the, the, the plan has been to uh, do this as a fleet renewal program. So in case the MAXs are not coming back or are delayed, well then we will just, which we have done really, is to stop selling the NGs. So, so that's the plan. So if, if, if something even worse happened with the Maxis compared to what we know today. Well, then we will just keep on flying these, uh, these engines. So I don't really see that as a major task uh, as such. And on, the, and on the 320s, as you know, we have that they are taken care of for the next three to four years at least. Hans Agenelis, we know. Two questions for me. Uh, the traffic passenger decline in Sweden is escalating also in 2020. Can you give some light on how this can impact Norwegian operations in Sweden uh, going forward? And second is uh, some airlines in Europe are now going from reporting monthly traffic figures to consolidate those into the quarterly reports. Will uh, Norwegian continue to deliver monthly traffic figures going forward? We don't have any other plans, I mean, so we expect to continue to do the monthly, the, you know, the, the regular one we are sending out. We are. And about no, Sweden? Sweden? Well, Sweden, uh, as you saw, as you saw when I went through the, the short haul, we have taken down capacity both in Finland and in, and in Sweden, and uh, and uh, and yes, the Swedish market is not as strong as uh, you know Norway and Denmark, and. Uh, but, but when we have taken out the capacity there, we are, we are also seeing that the yields are starting to come up at, at a lower capacity. So, so we, will have to, we will have to just do that, adjust uh, when we see a market that is not developing the way we would like it to be. And, 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 and it is a fact that the Swedish market is not performing in, in, in line with, uh, especially Norway and, and Denmark in the Nordics. So, so we are adjusting, and then, and then if we have to do, we will adjust more uh, than what we have already done. So, a few questions from uh, the online audience. <coughs> so, from uh, Ole Martin Vesgård in DNB Markets. Uh, how much credit card capacity do you currently have, and what do you expect in terms of capacity going forward? Well, we are not really guiding on capacity on credit card acquires, but it's quite obvious that we don't have the capacity that we need as for today. Uh, as we said uh, lo late last year, we have uh, we are in on we were then in, in the process of onboarding new credit card capacity, and uh, we are we still are. We have some delays, uh, which is also reflected in the liquidity. But we are you know we are now on the process in the process of uh, getting live with one big one, um, and we are also due to all the measures that we did last year, seeing that. Uh, the, the, the credit card acquires that has been with us for a while is now starting to open up again and give us uh, additional uh, credit. Uh, but as I've said earlier, now we have taken down the capacity. But you could say that the, the need for capacity is, I would say, in, in today's production, it's, uh, it's seven, eight hundred million, uh, ideally, uh, during the winter. And then it's less than half during the summer due to the seasonality uh, in the company. And... Uh, and we are on our way to, to you know, to, to increasing uh, the, those, uh, those uh, you know, capacities. Uh, and you will see uh, the effect of that going forward now during the next uh, months. And I think lastly, due to time running out, uh, is the interline partnership with JetBlue evolving into anything bigger? Will you cooperate with JetBlue on their transatlantic services from Andrew Lubenberg in HSBC? Well, I think, you know, <coughs> as a 
phase one, I mean, the, that relationship will, will, will turn into an interlining, you know, a, but, a, but, a, but a, a real interlining agreement where you have, a, you know, the seamless uh, move of luggage, etc., which we don't have with EasyJet, by the way. So, so it will, first of all, be a, a, an interlining project um, and with, with the major kind of connecting point in Boston, New York, and Fort Lauderdale. And, and that we are planning that, you know, to come live during the next months and then then we will, we will see how it goes, and then we will take it from there, really. But, but that's the plan, plan for, the, you know, for the next uh, 45 months. I think with that, we um, have, to, have to call off now. Thank you all for joining.